three in person and one online uh, event. Uh, this week we're back to a purely uh, online uh, uh, format. And today we're really delighted to welcome Professor Lin Weiping from National Taiwan University for her book talk um, on Island Fantasia, imagining subjects on the military front line between Taiwan and, and China. The book came out in uh, September uh, 2021 and is published by the University of Cambridge Press. And one of the nice things, well, there's a couple of nice things about this book. Uh, one of them is that the book is published um, on open access. So that means that anyone can um, uh, can get access to the book, even if you're not um, affiliated to a, a university. We do, um, um, if you're SOAS students, um, you can get the ebook um, a link from our SOAS library. Um, and also the SOAS library uh, has ordered the paperback, but it hasn't quite um, arrived uh, yet. Another thing that's really exciting about this book is that it's the first book in the uh, University of Cambridge Press's Taiwan Studies book series. Um, and I think it's another mark of the um, um, of how vibrant the field of Taiwan studies is today, that we have not only do we have the uh, this new series, we have a new series at, at Taiwan series at Brill. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the series at uh, Routledge, which has now been going over um, mm -hmm. uh, 10 years. So it's a really exciting, um, uh, exciting time. And um, and running a Taiwan series is not easy. And, I, and I'm really delighted that uh, Professor Lin Weiping was so persuasive to Cambridge <laughs> to actually create this um, a new kind of landmark um, in the field. Um, Professor Lin um, did her PhD um, in anthropology at Cambridge, uh, graduating in uh, 1998. Um, and um, she's currently a professor at National Taiwan University. And although she's not been um, back to the UK Cambridge, she's a frequent visitor to um, uh, Cambridge in uh, uh, the Harvard uh, Cambridge. I'm also really delighted that she's um, doing this this talk um, on a topic of Taiwan's offshore islands. It's something that we've often neglected in our Taiwan Studies um, project at uh, at SOAS. Um, I was thinking back, and the last time we had a talk that kind of dealt with Mazu was back in 2014, when we had a talk that looked at the um, um, at casino uh, referendums in Mazu oh. and um, and Penghu. Um, um, so that's that's about the only time we've covered this um, uh, uh, this this topic. So I'm really delighted that you'd be willing to share um, 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 part of the uh, research for uh, this book. So let's give Professor Lin a very, very big uh, SOAS uh, welcome. OK, over to you, Professor Lin. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Um, it's my great pleasure to speak to you today. Um, um, thank you, David, again for inviting me to talk about my book, Island Fantasia. Let me set up the, the slides. OK, so everyone can hear it, right? Good, good. OK, um, I will start it. I will start now. Island Fantasia is the first book of the new Taiwan study series by Cambridge University, as uh, David has already you know, introduced it to you. It discusses, but this work, you know, I'm I'm also very happy that you know the the first book is about is about Mazu, not um, not uh, the the main island. It, it it gives us a very fresh start. So it discusses the Mazu Islands, forlorn and isolated outpost of southeast China, who were suddenly transformed into a military front line in 1949 by the Cold War and the communist and nationalist conflict. The nationalist army occupied the islands 
commencing more than 40 long years of military rule. With the lifting of martial law in 1992, the people of Mazu were confronted with the question of how to move forward. The ethnography and social history of the islands um, in this book focus on how individuals struggle to face their uncertain future by forging social imaginaries. So this book is not only about Mazu, but also about Taiwan and us in general. Um, I have problem in, oh, okay, good. Let me show you where Mazu Islands, where the Mazu Islands uh, are located. The map shows there are two groups of military islands between China and Taiwan. Um, the southern, the southern uh, islands, maybe most of you are more, much more familiar with, um, are Jinmen, Jinmen Islands. They are comparatively large, low settled and well developed. Mazu is in the north, you know, it, um, it, it's made of much smaller scattered isolates with limited resources. So um, we can take a closer look at these islands from north to from north to the south. They are called Xi'in, Dong'in, Beigan, Nangan, Xiju and Dongju. Then you can see it's very close to uh, China is very close to Fuzhou city and most of them or a lot of them came from, I mean, they uh, they moved from Changle, Changle area. The Mazu, the, uh, I first went to Mazu in 2006. It's it's the first time I um, I came to this island because I was invited to participate in a conference called Mazu in Mazu. In English, you, you, you can say that it, it, it's it's something like a goddess Mazu was buried in the Mazu Islands. The islanders at that time were pondering whether they could use the, this myth, um, you know, uh, goddess Mazu was buried there, whether they could use this myth somehow to create a niche for themselves between China and Taiwan. So you see this triangle, oh, let me show you. this tri in this triangle, oh, something wrong. In this triangle, um, Mazu is located in the, you know, in the, in the, at the top. And, you know, so it has uh, China on his left hand side and Taiwan on his right hand side. The myth is based on a stella erected by a military commander in 1963. This stella now looks very blurred, very difficult to read, but the local people sort of uh, reinterpreted and then made another stella and now it's erected in front of the goddess temple. So the inscription says that after goddess Mazu jumped into the sea to save her father and died, her corpse floated to the shore of Mazu. Her remains were buried there. Going by how oceanic waves work, it's probably not a true story, but the islanders seize upon it and set up a giant statue, as you can see on your uh, right hand side, you know, a giant statue of the goddess. There were also other big projects in Mazu. In many places, you can see houses have been rebuilt and preserved in its own style. The attempt is to remake Mazu as an Eastern Fujian cultural village, Mingdong Wenhua Chun. Temples were also rebuilt in Eastern Fujian style. I mean, after after 2000, you know, you see a lot of uh, projects were. Uh, uh, going on. So after an important temple was completed, the Mazu Islanders undertook a cross strait pilgrimage starting from Taiwan. As you can see here, they started from Jilong and they, they stopped in Mazu and then landed in Ningde 
and then take a, a huge detour from Ningde to Pingnan, Gutian, Fuzhou, and then finally uh, arrive their root temple in Changle, and then back to Mazu. The aim was to build new relations with China and to show how Mazu could be a connecting point between Taiwan and China. They even tried to draw an uh, draw in an American casino capitalist to build a large gambling resort. I guess this is probably what David just mentioned. You know, probably you discussed this um, uh, already. Um, in a way, I also in my book, I also discuss uh, this event in my chapter in chapter 10. So anyway, I'm glad that I did not choose that chapter because I think, you know, probably you more or less heard about this. But um, so I chose another story to to discuss. Um, however, they met, you know, uh, the, the they met significant opposition to this plan from young generation. I. I guess you, or I probably, I think you have already discussed this. Um, there are a lot of disagreement and referendum, you know, uh, took place at, at the end. So we see how they continue, I mean, the Mazu people continue, continually pursued possibilities to redefine themselves. Given this remarkable series of imaginative projects, I was curious about how how did, how did these imaginations come, come about? How do people negotiate different generations and power relations? In contemporary society, especially very individualist society, how is social imagination possible? According to Charles Taylor, his book in two, published in 2003, social imaginary is the way in which the members of a community imagine their existence. It forms the common understanding of how to carry out the, the collective practices that constitute social life. However, in contemporary society, not just one, but multiple social imaginations coexist. How do people negotiate collective imagin imaginaries become an important question. Imagination can also be very irrational. So when we discuss imagination, how do we understand hope, effect, and fantasy entailed by it? This is what the you know, book is concerned. Let me briefly review the literature on imagination and society. Um, in, imagine community, I believe most of you read this book. Benderson, uh, Benedict Anderson depicts how print capitalism generates a commonality among people and lays the basis for nationalism. In Modernity at Large, Arjun Apadurai discusses how mass media brought about new kinds of imagination, which acquires an important power in power in contemporary life. Charles Taylor expands the discussion of social imaginary from print media to broader social institutions, such as, uh, you know, such as uh, especially three kinds of social institutions, namely market economy, public sphere and self-governed people. But Taylor's analysis does not delve into the infiltration process or the inherent tensions. It is not surprising that subsequent research, research focused on the technologies of imagination, that is the concrete process by which imaginate, imaginative effects are engendered. In ensuing works, the function of medium has received much more attention. Crucially, the role of person or subject is still waiting to be incorporated. Um, still life, uh, Henrietta Moore, she's the head of, uh, she was, she was the head of uh, Cambridge Uni University when I, when I studied there. She has a book, uh, explores, which explores how various kinds of mediums or the forms of the possible in her own words can reshape the self and thus how subjectification occurs. 
These mediums, as she pointed out, can magnify interior meanings and feelings, supplementing and extending individual sensations and emotions, and engendering new agency and social connections to form ethical imagination. Her work is very insightful for me. You know, um, uh, when I read, you know, when I read her work after I left Cambridge, but then, you know, when I had the chance to read her this book, you know, it's very uh, inspiring for me because the model, you know, the it, it fits with model in such a perfect way. Um, the Mazo Islands, in their long history, were considered a forbidden outpost. Fengshan Jingyang. There was very little farming land, and the inhabitants were a largely transient population who made a living by fishing. In 1949, the conflict between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party in China, as well as the US and Soviet Cold War, drastically changed the fate of Mazu as it was abruptly turned into a military front line under strict control of the army. It's only after 1992, when military rule was lifted, that individual imagination gained much space to develop. In Island Fantasia, I explore how individuals, after gaining freedom, applied different medium, me, mediating technologies to reach out to people and together to draw new blueprints for the island's future. Importantly, I explore the unconscious effects, emotion, and fantasies generated in this in the subjectification process. So this is the the context, uh, the chapters of my book. Um, the mediating technologies I discuss uh, um, mostly in chapter chapter eight um, chapter eight about community building project and then chapter nine uh, crossings uh, across straight pilgrimage and chapter 10 asia mediterranean casino resort they formed you know they formed uh, part three of my book but i want to emphasize not all of the projects succeeded actually a lot of them failed to explain why so many projects failed, yet the islanders still keep on trying new ways and struggling. We have to understand part two, new technologies of imagination, which summarizes part one and lays the basis for part three. Ethnographically, I'm influenced by Erin Mugler's book, The Age of Wild Ghosts. I guess probably you, you know about this, this book. It's about uh, south, uh, southwestern China, and who first raised the issue of social imaginary. And by Michael Sony's work, Cold War Island, he, uh, he, he did research in uh, Jinmen. So in a way, um, I get a lot of inspiration from this, this book. You know, it gives me a basis to move on to Mazu. Let me give you the background of digital Mazu. Chapter five did provides important information about Mazu online, Mazu Zixun Wang. Um, it's a website reporting news about Mazu Islands. It started in 2001 when, when Facebook was not yet popular. The local newspaper, Mazu Daily, was under strict control of the government. On Mazu Online, netizens can use anonymous names to freely express what they think. Uh, what they think, new online selves thus appear. They criticize the government and engage in conflicts with the local society. There are many controversies in this website. You know, some netizens sometimes kill each other. Uh, it's not always so smooth. But without doubt, Matsu Online has reshaped the islands from a springboard against communism, Fan Gong Tiaoban, into a place with its own value and worth. Because all the news in this website only uh, talk about Mazu. So 
you in this website you can see everything happening in these islands. That's why I said even there are so many controversies. This website, in a way, still forms the you know the identity and the so solidarity of the of 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 Mazu and you know reconfirm the the value. I will discuss this later. Chapter six is about. Um, Oh, sorry. I'm not going to discuss the whole, you know, the 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 this website. But I will choose only one from 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 here. It's uh, you know, chapter six is about uh, creating online war memory. Uh, the chapter zooms into rooms into individuals and the ways in which they have undergone transformation in the online world, starting uh, in 2005. A husband and a wife team began to publish a series of posts on Mazu Online. So it's here. Uh, it's here. Xia Shuhua and Lei Mengdi, Zuo Pingqi. It, it's still uh, uh, collected in in this uh, in in this website. The images. So the. the the posts have already, you know, they have already uh, transformed the uh, published the posts and then turn into, you know, turn into a book. But what I what I'm going to tell you is, how, you know, how this process happens. The images were drawn by Chen Tianshun, a Mazu Islander who emigrated to Taiwan. And the text was written by his Taiwanese wife, Xia Shuhua, who had never lived in Mazu. Given the enthusiastic response of netizen, the duo continue their collaboration for three years, accumulating in the book The Wartime Childhood, Le Monde. Hereafter, I just uh, use Le Monde, published in 2009. Much beloved, it was selected as the book of Mazu, Mazu Zhi Shu. Le Monde means hooligan uh, in the Mazu dialect, Lui Mondia. That's what I heard them saying. Um, and the expression Le Monde is also uh, is often used as a general term for boys. The book narrated in the first person by Le Monde thus represents both Chen Tianshun's experiences as well as those of most Mazu children. Below I will start to e examine the writing of Le Monde, analyzing how Chen Tianshun's experiences growing up in Mazu contain two kinds of self. One is an island social cultural self. The second is a military oppressed self. Then I discuss how a collective online memory is collected, is created. I asked Chen why his family had moved to Taiwan. He told me that Mazu fishing economy had declined and his family, his father could no longer support the family by fishing in Chaozi Chun, um, Chaozi village. It's a, you know, it's a village in Beigan. When Chen graduated from middle school, the whole family moved to Taiwan. Chen studied five arts and after graduation worked as a cartoonist for several animation companies. He lived in Taiwan for 27 years without even returning once to Mazu. I asked him if he hadn't missed the island. He frowned and said, um, he said, as far as I am concerned, it wasn't such a great place. Shu Hua had been telling me for a long time that she wanted to go back with me to see it. But I just told her that it's a barren and dying place. I only went back in 2005 because of the land dispute with the government. Then I asked him, when, when, you, when, um, um, when you came here, came to Taipei, did you contact other people from Mazu in Taiwan? He replied, I did. I didn't go get to know any others from Mazu aside from occasional contact with some high school mates. Nevertheless, during the, this time, he would occasionally post a few cartoons of Mazu on, on Mazu online, criticizing the state for fooling the people and occupying their land. This is about, you know, for example, this one. 
this is actually Lemondi himself, and that's his mother. So the, these policemen or soldiers came to say, "Oh, uh, the, we please let us give use your land when when we Guangfu Dalu take the China, you know, back. We will return the land uh, back to you." But finally, it never, you know, it never happened. So he was very angry and then posted uh, something like this. Very, you know, when he had time to draw. I asked Chen why he started uh, drawing the Lei Mundi series. His wife, Xia Shuhua, sitting beside me, I interviewed them together, answered that when she uh, joined her husband as he went home to negotiate his land dispute with the government, she was very moved to see his hometown for the first time. So she wrote about her feelings in an essay entitled Total Lunar Eclipse, Yue Quan Shi and posted it on Mazu online. To her surprise, the click rate was so high, so encouraged that she continued to write. The enthusiastic response of netizens also inspired her cartoonist husband to begin, you know, join her and, you know, started to illustrate her work. The Island Cultural South, opening a book, what immediately leaps to the eye is the carefully drawn village of Chaozi, where Lemundi grew up. In this drawing, Chen recreates the houses of the 1960s with incredible accuracy, oh, so detailed, as you can see. Even though more than half of them have already dis disappeared today, and he never ever went back to the island for you know almost 30 years, he could still paint it in such a detailed way. So the precision undoubtedly shows that his youth was the most important period in his life. Family. Below the drawing, Xia provides a wonderful description of how Le Mundi's family managed to support eight people, two pigs, and a dozen of chickens. Everyone has a job to do. Household economy. During Le Mundi's childhood, the ocean around Mazu Island still teemed with small shrimp. Processing shrimp was a complex process that required the participation of the whole family. So uh, I remember when I did a few work there, I tried to, you know, ask people how did they do the, the shrimp, you know, how do they dry the, the shrimp or something. They, I never got to know the details until when I saw the book, you know, everything is clear to me until, you know, when I see these pictures, you know, these uh, drawings, everything is close, you know, so clear to me. So he say, so, so you can see when the, fishing boats returned. The shrimp was firstly sorted on the beach, then taken back uh, to each family's fishing hut to be boiled, to, you know, dried and laid out on bamboo, you know, mats. You can see the, the process. And to continue to dry in the sun, all before it could be sold. Boring chairs. Chen also made extremely detailed depictions of village ceremonies and events, such as weddings. In the small communities of Mazu, when a wedding was held, the family would borrow tables and chairs from anyone they could. Children's party. The islands carry on the customs of eastern Fujian, where the tradition was that wedding celebrations lasted three days with a separate men's party, women's party, and children's party. The children's party would be held three days before the wedding. Before the banquets begin, uh, began, children would uh, beat a gong and shout as loudly as possible. The gongs ringing, come and drink. When they heard, when the kids heard the sound of the gong, the other, you know, the the, uh, the other children were happily run over to join the fun. And he also painted uh, let, uh, lantern festival, um, uh, Yuan Xiao Jie. You know, it's the most important uh, ritual in Mazu. And he also uh, he painted uh, deity Yang, you know, the local deity in Mazu, uh, taming uh, demons on the on the sea. We saw his personal, you know, fantasy. As he grew up, Le Mundi often played uh, by the seaside and enjoyed the beauty of the ocean. 
the exquisite scenery of Mazu was imprinted on his mind through his childhood games. So we see here, you know, he uh, he was swimming, and then, you know, um, um, actually there's a woman. I don't know whether you can see this is a woman lying on the beach, the beach, and this is where his hometown. He he walks back and forth, and he's looking at us, you know. This is, you know, with such a lovely eye, with such lovely eyes. The military, the militarily oppressed self. Lemon D is the first book to describe the physical and psychological harm that military rule wreaked on the islanders. The terror, oppression, and trauma of the of the time are evoked through the visceral content, paralleling the social cultural context of Mazu described earlier. Terror. Given the haste with which Chiang Kai-shek's army came to Mazu, many soldiers were billeted in the homes of islanders. The second floor of Lemondi's house was turned into the military bureau. Lemondi often heard the young soldiers' low sobs mixed with their helpless terror. In the, in the night, it seemed they were often forsaken by the world. Not only soldiers, but the Mazu Islanders were also faced terror. Once Leimundi's father and a few other men from the village disappeared for several days after accidentally crossing the international boundary while fishing. Every so often, Fishermen from mainland China who had drifted off course in the mist would appear in the village, and Lehman Di watched them be blindfolded and dragged off by soldiers. Trauma. The trauma of the military rule was mostly keenly felt when loved ones met with violence or abuse. The women of Chaozi often went to the seaside to gather shellfish in order to supplement their household incomes. One day, Lemondi's mother and aunts went to gather wild, wild vegetables. They were caught and held by soldiers from the garrison. And only when village leaders came to negotiate were they released. That night, his mother kept crying in pain. And as Lemondi self her back, he saw that she was bruised as though she had been beaten. From then on, whenever she went to the seaside, Lemondi would wait until dusk, gazing anxiously towards the mountain ridge until he glimpsed her and could relax. Bodily injuries, maimed or crippled characters frequently appeared in the name of these series, they are heard by usually by these lame lies, um, which is you know you can see how he, you know he he he, he drew this. Lemondi's mother's story is perhaps the most tragic. As a young newlywed, her her new husband was conscripted into a war game, a, a work game, and then moulded mortally wounded by a lame line. Unfortunately, as that, at that time, marriage was a matter of agreement between two families, and the remote islands did not issue marriage licenses. These marriages were not recognized by the government. So not only was Lemondi's mother ineligible for compensation, the young widow had to bear the burden of losing her husband all on her own. Mazu locked in mist. These intractable problems seem to be the inexorable fate of the islands. Lemondi can only stand behind a barbed wire and stare out help hopelessly at his own island of Beigan. So you see Lemondi, I mean, imagine him standing another place and you know gazing the island Beigan. In Lemondi, the word mist is very frequently used as a metaphor for Mazu caught in a war zone atmosphere. I quote, it was a special feeling to run through 
thick mist. It was as though you knew how long the road was, but could never know how deep the mist was." End quote. The Mazu Islands frequently experienced fog when all communication with the outside world was cut off. Chen builds a metaphor of the war zone atmosphere as a mist that locks Mazu down so that people are lost in a miasma. Unable to orient themselves or tell which direction they are heading. For this reason, distant Taiwan became a treasured island, Baodao. Oh, when I heard this word, I was so surprised because in Taiwan, you never, you hardly, you know, people say that it's like Guidao. But when I heard this, you know, from Mazu people's, you know, mouth, I was so surprised. They say they said it's Baodao for them at that time. Lemondi was eager to grow up because his mother often said to him, when you are older, you can go to the treasured island of Taiwan. When he was uh, around 15, his family moved to Taiwan, leaving his, their geography of pain behind. Healing through a wife's pain. This, these rich accounts of war zone were written by a Taiwanese women, woman who had never lived in Mazu herself, Chen's wife, Sha Suhua. The dual creation process generally involved Chen telling a story to Sha, who would then write it down. Chen explained, I quote, she, managed, she manages to capture the experiences of the Mazu people. It would be hard for a local Mazu person to write this way. Her relatively distant relationship with Mazu allows her a certain objectivity." End quote. Of course, Shah's, Shah's texts do not merely transmit Chen's memories. She often adds a twist to Chen's mournful stories of military rule. For example, in the section of Mist, she lights up the hope for the future of the islands. I quote, the sun that had disappeared behind the mountains would rise again next morning, and the mist would finally be dispelled. End quote. The hopeful future, of, uh, the hopeful future, transfigured from past sorrows, had helped Chen gradually face his painful childhood and reach a sense of self-transcendence and salvation through the writing process. Then I move on to talk about the relay of memories. The Lemondi's stories have received tremendous support and participation from Mazu Islanders. Whenever a story was published online, netizens often enthusiastically shared similar experiences of their own. For example, Huang Jinghua, who had uh, emigrated to Canada, wrote, uh, I quote, reading Sha Shuhua's work is like uh, looking at an old a photograph. Certainly, I see how I made it through. Things at that time were muddled and confusing, end quote. Netizens support. Netizens provided crucial emotional ballast for the couple to persist with the project. For instance, Tian Shun wrote on Mazu Online, this afternoon I exhausted myself revising a drawing of kitchen. But when I saw the response of my fellow villager, Mu Er, I felt revived. So he, uh, you know, he had to, you know, he saw the touching words, you know, given, written by his, um, fellow villagers so he so he could continue. Indeed, what could, one could say that this work of more than three years could not have been completed without netizens. Throughout the process, there was a collaboration between the creators and the readers and the locals and not locals, all of which brought the series to life. As one netizens commented, each time I was not just moved by your stories, they are also all of those readers who are moved by you and their responses really touch me. So we can see the boundary between the individual and the social becomes blurred. Unsurprisingly, when the Lemondi series was collected and published as a book in 2009, it was celebrated by netizens who felt that Lemondi's childhood echoed a much wider experience. 
So I saw their posts. They said, Lemonti's childhood under military rule is also our childhood. And another netizen says that it's a period of we all went through. And they are memories that we all have. New subject, new mazu. Online media not only provided new forms of sociality to to Tianshun, who had been displaced and had, had long refused to confront his past and his homeland, but also brought a new understanding of the place. He explained, these past few years, as I have tried to get my land back from the government, I've returned to Mazu to do land surveys. Only now I appreciate how my parents had to, had to work in this terribly remote and difficult place. But now we have new technologies and we can have a different kind of lifestyle on Mazu from the one we had before. This is to say Tianshun has not only discovered a new Mazu, but also fresh possibilities for the future. In a new era, equipped with the new technologies, he imagines that he could remake his hometown into a new world to re-inhabit and to transcend his painful past. He also began to ask for the land back. I quote, I'm not asking all of the land back from the government, only for the places that have stories like the spot on the beach where my mother used to collect shellfish. These soldiers chased her and beat her until she was black and blue. Chen Tianxuan's narration shows that what he's fighting for is not compensation, but rather the right to attach a sense of purpose to his life, a meaning for his existence. Having been reawakened in the process of creating Le Monde, the afflictions of military rule, which previously caused him so much suffering, have now filled him with new power. By grappling directly with the humiliation and oppression his family suffered, he's attempting to rediscover his morals, emotions, and effects, as well as to restore ethical value to the people who were abused by the state. As for his wife, Xiao Shuhua, he told me, um, he said, uh, she, she told me, she said, I've been writing advertising copy for my whole life, but it wasn't until I started working on Le Monde series that I truly found joy in writing. Although the Le Monde series has already ended, Sha has not stopped writing. Now she continues writing things for herself. Conclusion. Um, internet writing as subjectification. In this talk, um, we have seen that, that online writing and drawing is a process of subjectification. It is so not only for Chen and his wife, but also for all the participating netizens. But it is only, it is particularly in Chen that we see most, most clearly how by drawing, writing, and sharing his work, he was gradually healed, turning himself into a subject, bringing morals emotions and effects together, he was able to transcend his old selves and to rediscover his capacity to act. The Le Monde series is also much more than just a chance personal reminiscence. It was chosen as a, mark, as a book of Mazu be precisely because it offered a collectivity in the person, representing the painful and violent experiences of a people under military rule in the form of a single child's story. That this web-based series of wartime memories could be woven so quickly reminds, of, reminds us of a key effect of internet technology in contemporary society. 
the ability to read and write provided by Web2 meant that netizens could immediately receive and respond. And this made online collective creations possible. Whenever they live in Mazu, Taiwan or elsewhere in the world, Mazu people can come together and interact in the virtual world, composing their war memory, their war memory communally. Through the course of the process, netizens participated in a social curation, mingling the individual and social, thereby producing a new collective identity. These memories, furthermore, carrying as they do the lord of shared traumatic experiences, are imbued with power and agency that could erupt at any moment. Le Monde, this is an important foundation for part three of the book, in which I discuss how the history of common struggle has become an internal motivating force for the people of Mazu. Ever since they were freed from the military rule, they persist in creating new social imaginaries to pursue better futures for the islands in the face of an uncertain future. The people of Mazu not only use internet technology, but also apply all kinds of ways, which I discuss in part three of this book. For example, community project, pilgrimage, or even casino, you know, building, um, uh, you know, trying to build a casino to connect themselves with the broader world. world. With the summary of the key chapter in my book, let me stop here now. Uh, we can continue the discussion with comments and questions. Thank you. Fantastic. That was a fascinating um, uh, uh, talk. It's, uh, yeah, I've got so many kind of um, uh, questions as you were kind of going through that um, uh, that chapter. Um, and the discussion about that um, military oppressed self kind of reminded a bit me of, of of some of the accounts we've heard from uh, activists from places like Wu Chiu and also uh, Penghu about the kind of the role of the um, of the military. Let me just start then with one kind of one kind of um, um, kind of technical question and then one um, uh, broader one. I was really curious about the uh, Le Mandi um, um, drawings and whether or not these were based entirely on memory or he was also using photographs. Um, um, particularly if these were done before he went uh, went back. So that was the, the kind of the first question. Um, and the other question I had that was, uh, you talked about how they'd um, framed um, Taiwan as the treasure island, the Baoda. And I was thinking about whether that might have changed, particularly as, as a result of um, the tourism from China and whether or not, um, uh, for some in in, in Mazu, uh, the um, the kind of the ideal land had actually become uh, places like Fuzhou, as you're so close to, uh, to Fuzhou. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, these are you know um, uh, you know very good questions. I will try to answer. Um, uh, why he? When I interview him, you know, he uh, hardly showed me uh, photographs. He uh, he told me that he it's mostly um, he it's mostly dependent on, dependent on his uh, memories. But uh, he also told me uh, actually in the posts you can also see that when he posted something, uh, netizens will respond to it and then say, oh, something you know you uh, need to revise a little bit. And then he would go back, he would go back to see, you know, to check. And then in a way, we discover the land. That's why at the end he said, oh, now we have so much technology now, right? So, so he, you know, he feel that uh, Mazu nowadays is so different from what he was before. So this creation process really helps him. So on one hand, the net, netizens uh, will, you know, sort of respond to, to what he wrote at, or what he 
or what he drew. And at the same time, he would also fly back to see whether it's correct or not. His memory is correct or not. So during the interview, during our interview, he never showed me any photo that he used. So it's very much based on memories. And also I found all the uh, most of the paintings uh, there, I mean, in the the uh, Le Monde series, are about the the past. The the past. So it's always much more about his memory. Yeah. Okay. So um, your second question is about uh, whether Mazu turns into great, uh, whether Bao Dao turns into great Dao. <laughs> Right, I think this is, um, um, you know, yeah, because after, you know, DPP um, arranged, right, so um, Shi Mingde say something, you know, Shi Mingde say something that we, uh, we, so for Taiwan independence, he implied that we can uh, sort of drop Jinmen and Mazu. That creates a, you know, such a, uh, sorrow for them you know they feel that they are going to be desert to be deserted by dbb so um so so they started to feel uh, um, very uh, complicated to form that complicated uh, um, image to mazu so for example um let me tell you something funny you know because i learned some uh, simple mazu dialect in front of Shen, Chen, because chen shong chen is here i i don't dare to speak much uh, <laughs> mazu dialect but i did really you know i i i did really spend time in learning the dialect and then um you know i remember once i was buying things in the market you know mazu market so they i was queuing to buy some uh damping, you know uh damping, right so i heard people saying that oh she's uh she's taiwan known taiwan so uh <laughs> they use their dialect right so she's taiwan known and then give us the dumping first you know sort of the, sort of something like that so you can see that that kind of uh um, uh, thing of course this all this you know because the military rule you know they it, it, you know it, it tries to the rule tries to make the island a sort of independent place which can be fight for by itself so so you see if another land uh, another island was taken over by the china chinese government then the other island has had to be able to fight for itself. So the connections with islands or with uh, Taiwan are very much cut off. So um, in a way, you know, um, so that's why they started to form that kind of imagination, you know, of, of Taiwan, which is a precious island. But now they can easily, uh, you know, come back and forth. And also because of DPP, Shi Ming the saying. So they started to, that kind of very ambiguous, very even they hated, you know, they hated uh, DPP so much. So Bao Dao is no longer Bao Dao. But it, but it wasn't Gui Dao so much, you know, for mm. them. Mm -mm. Okay, let me hand over then to um, one of my students, Cheng Yu. Did you want to come in with your question? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Professor Ling. Uh, it's quite interesting book. Here I have. <laughs> Thank you so a much. A paperback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, it's a very, I, I really was enjoying reading it. Uh, and I have, um, and also my research interest is quite related to the offshore island studies and um, the human mobility part. So I basically have very much questions. Let me start with my first one, which is your in your uh, lecture about the uh, online and offline uh, uh, topic. When you are talking about uh, the Lehman story in your tale that uh, you, you, I, I feel like there's a, a, a focus on storytelling, storytelling as a practice. Uh, in this case, you are uh, also mentioned about the netizens and the online self. But I'm also aware that you know the social media or digital media is changing generation by generation so fast. So in maybe in your as not in your field work is still the website generation. But currently we are 
embracing the uh, the Facebook, maybe Twitter, and I do think that the the change of the social media itself, the platform itself, are do facilitating more uh, uh, social relations in, in between uh, between the netizens. So I do feel is that uh, uh, it's more like changing the netizen or the online self into an online space where people are inhabiting but also in experiencing their everyday life not just uh, about the production of the content but also uh, the response or reproduce of the content so uh, my question is like as you as a we as an anthropologist how do we like cope with this swift change of the digital media and my second question is about the human mobility. Um, for example, in your uh, tale in uh, Le Monde, um, the last, the ending of that is Le Monde have their, his longing of go to the uh, go to Taiwan. And also follow up with David's uh, kind of uh, idea that maybe the Baudau is kind of idea of the tourism. So I was thinking. Uh, is there any your observation on how uh, both uh, the during the military like period, but also the uh, post uh, military like the uh, free time period, like how the change of the human mobilities on Mazu are influencing uh, this idea of uh, imagination of subjectivity of Mazu people? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, thank you for your questions. They are very good. You know, thank you. The reading is in such a, you know, um, with such great effort. Yeah. Um, let me uh, ask you a first question. To, uh, first, um, uh, when I when I first went to Mazu, which is uh, it's around two thousand seven, um, even at that time, website. Uh, I don't have internet connect, you know, we don't have Wi-Fi at all. So I still practice a kind of a very uh, traditional way of uh, interviewing and then uh, something like this, you know, just uh, do you face to face uh, interview or something until one day one uh, the, the website uh, uh, organizers asked me, he said, oh, Professor Lin, how come you, you don't study us? Right, you you only uh, 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 you know pra use this methods, but we Mazu people don't apply this. Uh, don't do not just do this. You know, face to face interaction. We talk a lot on inter uh, on the web page. So why don't you read and then respond to us? Something like this. So I was so frightened uh, that, that that you know in two thousand seven. It was, uh, you know, it has already this kind of uh, web, this kind of uh, website is already a part of their life. So it's also the period which in which I engaged the most because I, I spent six months in that islands, you know, I mean, do a very intensive field work. Then after that, I, w I went back, you know, in the summers. Right, so it's a uh, six months which I have a very sort of uh, intensive engagement with uh, with with the people and also the website. That's why I more or less use the that kind of period that I that I I read a lot, you know, there. So I, of course I understand that um, nowadays people use Facebook or multiple pe people do not use Twitter much. They use Facebook a lot. So even the organizer, the website organizer understands it and he has already changed it into a kind of different website from what he was, you know, in 2007. So it, he told me that now he tried to make it like a, you know, like a Google that uh, people uh, tr will get to know or when the aircraft, uh, you know, uh, has the aircraft uh, come to Mazu or, uh, you know, it just because of the fog, it, it goes back. So they can get some sort of daily information on on the, they make it, he tried to make it uh, necessary for people's daily life. 
so so yeah it's true that that's why you what you are saying is correct you know uh, in uh, medias are changing you know who knows uh, you know when i mean nowadays students don't use facebook anymore right they use instagram so after 10 years instagrams will disappear so the point is to how you know, I use this as an example to discuss how people form social imaginary. So, of course, you can use Facebook or a Twitter to discuss how people negotiate with each other on Facebook or in Twitter or in Instagram, in other media mediating technologies to form their so to form the social imaginary. That's the purpose of my book. So that's why later on they I discuss why they you know they when they practice uh, pilgrimage it's also a way that they, they want to form their social imaginary because they want to see whether they could take the road of connecting point that they could still even they are not fan gong tiao ban but they still can connect to china with taiwan they remind each other you know that we are still very important mazu is still very important please look at us i think that's the the the, the point you know they 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 uh, they they um, uh, yeah this is uh, my answer to the first question and then the second question human mobility of course that's why i write uh, chapter 7 8 and 9 and 10 each time it's a gradually you see uh, Asia the casino thing they try to make it itself into Asian Mediterranean but at the beginning they just want to say oh we are uh, we want to become a village of uh, cultural village of uh, Eastern Fujian right so with the time moves on you know when they get to know more and more people when the, the when they connect with the broader world or when these american you know not just american casino casino capitalists there's so many cas casino capitalists came to visit them so they started to realize oh we mazu have so much potential we could do this that uh, you know that we never imagined before so that's how they you know um People came to visit them, right? And they had uh, interactions with them. So that's why, you know, they feel, oh, we can do more and more things. The flow of people make them, you know, understand themselves e even more. So sure, this human for uh, mobility, as you said, you know, mobility, people can come in and, you know, certainly gradually change the way they understand themselves and also the way they understand the world. Great. I can see we've got a couple of questions um, in the um, uh, text questions. Uh, Leandor, who can't talk now, he's, he's um, asked this. Uh, so thanks for your inspiring talk. I'd like to know more about how you differentiate bef between memory and imagination. In your presentation, it seems like that you demonstrate memory and imagination separately, but how are they uh, interviewed in your case study? Also, imagination seems future oriented. Um, uh, in your argument, while well, memory past oriented, I wondered if you'd discuss this um, um, in your book. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, um, in my book, I basically use, you know, I think each person has its own memory or its own imagination. But what I, I am, what I mostly focus on is how an individual memory turn into a collective memory or how how is it possible? How is it possible that an individual imagination could turn into a collective imagination? So, um, for example, in this chapter, I discuss memory, right? So the next chapter, I discuss uh, someone's uh, great uh, imagination about pilgrimage or someone thinks that we could become an Asian Mediterranean, uh, you know, by drawing this capitalism, casino capitalism, we uh, can form another kind of imagination. So in this case, in this, so my focus more is on imagination. Memory is a way that I use to discuss how imaginative or ethical, how is ethical imagination possible? Yeah, so the, 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 yeah, this is um, my answer to, to, to Anton. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, Boshi, did you want to come in? We've got uh, Chen Boshi from uh, at University of Cambridge. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lin. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure. So my question is maybe unrelated to the talk today, but I wonder how the Cold War presence figures in today's module, because uh, a couple of years ago, I met with an American anthropologist at Yale by the name of Michael Cole, who was sent to Mazu, actually by Chen Island. So it's even a smaller island off Mazu in the 50s. So he worked for this Western enterprises, Xifang Gongsi, which was, which uh, took the name of a Gongsi, but it was actually formed by the CIA as some kind of Cold War operation. So. Uh, you mentioned you did mention this enterprise briefly like once in your book so i was wondering if you come across any of its you know former workers or data in your field work thank you okay uh thank you for boshi's uh, question um about cold war or xifang gongsi um i think historians are much more interested in this you know when i went to xiju don't do xiju xiju yeah when i went to xiju with michael sony uh we tried to sort of uh, try to uh, discover the 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 content of these this xifang gongsi or you know something like this but we got very little uh data we try to interview people, but they, what they say, you know, we uh, always end up with very little, uh, very little data. So for for me, it becomes very difficult to to develop. That's why most uh, uh, historians in Taiwan are not interested in Mazu at all. This is the point, you know, because we don't we ha we had a very little information and no written things. So I think some historians are still making their effort, but I I did not really pursue this because I think as an anthropologist, my job is to understand the lived world of people. So if they can't really provide you uh, answers, then I just I just don't really, you know, because we are much more concerned with how people um, experience the Cold War. That's why in my in my chapter, especially I think chapter four, I discuss gambling. You know, in during the Cold War, right? How did they fight with the military? You know, people military pe uh, these military people do not uh, did not allow them to do to um, gamble. So they uh, they intentionally did this. It, it's also a way to protest the, the government. So more or less, I see myself as an anthropologist. And I um, even I want to face the issue of Cold War. I will take, I will study I, or I will consider from the local people's perspective. And Shifang Gongsi let the historians do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, fantastic. So, uh, Patrick, did you want to come in with your question? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hou Guanghao, and I'm teaching at the National Kimo University. So uh, we had uh, email interactions with, uh, with Professor Fell. And uh, I'm, uh, first, allow me to thank Professor Fell very much for providing this uh, public access to uh, this today's talk and uh, I feel privileged to be able to participate it because I was also asked by China Quarterly to write oh. a book review for <laughs> <laughs> Professor Lin's, uh, Lin's book and uh, I'm a student of politics but uh, I don't I, I don't know why China Quarterly asked me probably because I guess probably they they think I've been teaching at Jinmen for a decade. I think uh, I, I think yes. Uh, I do have. Uh, I th I find uh, Professor Lin's book very very well written, and uh, her writing style is very clear. But I do st I still have several uh, technical questions to ask. If I I hope uh, I, I I wish Professor Lin will be able to. Be, be willing to teach me. Uh, first question is about 
some uh, definitions of several important concepts which I am not very familiar with. For example, the first one is imaginary. imaginary and I, I'm wondering uh, what would be the relationship between imaginary and identity. And you started the book by discussing uh, and uh, ben, uh, Benedict Anderson's imaginative, uh, imagined community. So this question pops up immediately when I first read the, the, the chapter. And I also, I'm also wondering what will be their relationships, I mean, imaginary and identity with subjectification. Uh, I, I think I, I know what Professor Lin wants to, to discuss through reading the whole book, but I'm just wondering if you could be so kind to, uh, to, to clarify a bit for me. And the second question is, I find your framework, the conceptual framework that you presented in your first chapter is very interesting. And I think they, they do have lots of potential to be applied to other examination or other studies of different social political phenomenon. I'm wondering if you can develop at this occasion to develop a bit more about the, the utilities of the, your, your framework, apart from uh, using it to study a, 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 an island like Maju or Jinmen. Uh, the other, the third, third question is about uh, uh, your methodology, and because of the, the the China quality also asked me to to introduce a bit, so I'm wondering apart from in, in addition to your to your uh, introduction uh, previously prov uh, provided, and you said you use very traditional face to face interviews, and do you have any other methods to help you to conduct your field work, or uh, or how long did you stay in the in Mazu for your field work, and how long did you spend on conducting this project? And the fourth question is about the potential audience. I can find I can see that this topic will be very interesting for for political scientists, especially international uh, scholars of international relations. For, for example, the the the. the the, uh, the scholar Chen, Dr. Chen, I suppose, uh, Chen Boxi from Cambridge, if I'm not wrong. And the, the question he addressed is very, can be classified as a, as, a, as a topic of international relations. But I don't know if your book can be widely used in anthropology for, te for example, teaching or for advanced reading by postgraduate students. Uh, this is just a question for me to, to begging for teaching from you. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much indeed. Right, right. Thank That's you. A lot of, lot of questions very there. good questions. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I know I, under, uh, I try to answer as much as possible. Um, okay. Um, you asked me about uh, imaginary, uh, imagination and identity. Yeah, that's a very good question. Because I think, you know, Mazu people, they came from Changle, Changle Xian, right? They, they were not Taiwanese. They, uh, you know, they, and they, they were trapped in this place in 1949. You know, they told me a lot of stories that they, their relatives stay, you know, just can't, cannot come back. So they also, they are really in between. You see, they are from, they were from China, but they cannot go to China. They were not Taiwanese, but they now belong to ROC. So identity is such a big issue. You know, they keep on asking themselves who we are. You know, who are we? We are we, uh, you know, they are sort of in between. So sometimes when I ask them, uh, you know, they will say, oh, 我们是长乐县人. Uh, I will teach my kids. They are Changle people. people. But when they, I when I go to kids, they will say, 我们是马祖人. We are Mazu. That uh, Changle is our past. That's our parents' uh, identity, not us. Right? So I think this is why 
at the end in chapter 10, I was talking about the, you know, I was talking about the casino issue. Why the young generation came out and, you know, voted against the, you know, the, 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 the casino resort because they want to, you know, they want to have their homeland. They, this is Mazu is their homeland. And they don't want that kind of past that their, their parents have. So I think, you know, why I talk about imagination, because they, by these series of, uh, this series of uh, imaginative works, either uh, at the beginning they say, oh, woman, uh, we try to build Ming Dong Wenhua Chun. So in a way they identify themselves with Ming Dong, right? Eastern Fujian. And later on they say, oh, we want to become the connecting point between Taiwan and China. So sort of they try to, you know, their identity is still that, oh, we could, uh, you know, play the the road, the zone, right? The, the road of bridge, we could, uh, but then finally they they find, they, they say, oh, no, we don't, we are not going to do this. We will become the Asia Mediterranean, new identity, right? We face the Asia. This is our world. Taiwan and Mazu is no more just narrowed in a very small place between China, China and Taiwan, right? Or at, in the beginning, it's just a Ming Dong Wen Hua Chun. So at the end, they say, oh, we are a part of Asia. So it's a way in their imagination. They are also explore. They are also exploring their identities. This is what I'm saying. I think that it's a, it's a, it's a process. You know, they are trying to find. That's why I think in the future there will be more and more projects coming on because no one knows who they. They are not really sure who they are yet. So there will be more projects, so more you know blueprints for their future, and this relates to. Uh, your second question, subjectification, subject in making, you know. So, so in a way, I think they are trying to define who we are, you know, subject, subjectification. In the past, uh, in the earlier period, they are just, uh, you know, 海道的小孩, or from, they were sort of, uh, you know, offshore islands in the China empires, right? You see, they are no, uh, in Qianlong, I, I wrote in chapter one, the long history, uh, they, their houses would be, you know, burned down just by an emperor and then call them back, you know. So this is just a, you know, sort of a pirate islands. And then second, second, in the second period, they were controlled by the government, right? So they, they are, they, I, 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 I wrote a story that they, a, a young guy told me, he said that, oh, see these guys, they have guns. How can I fight with them? You know, we have to obey them or something, but then, you see, only in the third period, you, you see, you know, people can come up, they can use internet to speak, to criticize the government. So it's the subject of subjectification I'm talking about. They can say what they like, they can, uh, in the past, they, they can only gamble and then, you know, sort of uh, protest, right? Whereas in the new, after 1992, when the martial law was lifted, they, they get the power, they get the agency. Right, that govern the government has to listen to them. My landlord works for the government, so he said, "Oh, Professor Lin, every time, every morning, the first thing I do when I wake up is to read Mazu online, Mazu Zixun Wang, so I can be sure that oh, whether my I can keep my job or not, or something like that." Okay, so your important question, third question, is that whether I can apply uh, this, this, the result of this work to other areas. Um, yeah, of course, I, that's my intention, right? Uh, or not really my, uh, my implication. Of course, I want to apply this uh, to other area beyond Mazu. Who else doesn't want to do this? Everyone wants to do this, right? But I have to admit that I have some, you know, uh, limits. And I think every place has its own uh, particular, uh, you know, history and, and, you know, political situations that, it needs uh, professor. It needs uh, authors more careful reading. So in it, at the end, I did not really, really, you know. For example, I did not cite Okinawa, or I did not really cite other places which have probably the same uh, situations. But I did write in introduction. I say that the rootness 
and the in between us, you know, revealed or uh, you know or you know illustrated in this book could echo what we are, you know, in the first the in the twenty first century. You see, they roots this the rootlessness. Oh, when I hear them talking about themselves, I also feel so. You see, Taiwan is just like um, Mazu in a way. Mazu is a prison of Taiwan, right? You see, Taiwan is between China and America, US. Every place is like this. UK is also between uh, United States and continent, Europe, Europe continent, right? So it dwindle or, uh, you know, you see, so this is the, the feeling, you know, the precarious feelings that I try to transmit, very a kind of precarity, precarious feelings that everybody has, the rootlessness and the in betweenness that you find in humanities and you find in contemporary political situations. You see Ukraine between Soviet Union, uh, uh, Russia, and um, Europe, right? something like this, and the United States between China and Europe. So yeah, it's in a way that I um, try to transmit by not in, you know, going deeper to the, to the details, which I probably not really good at. Yeah, so- Okay, have, maybe because, um, because we kind of run out of time, maybe we'll have to leave that fourth question. Do you mind if I bring in uh, Song Chuan? Um, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, uh, as we, uh, I think we've only got about five minutes left, and it'd be good to get a a, a, a Mazua's, um take on today's presentation. Uh, thank you, David. Um, thank you, Wei Binafsi, for fascinating, amazing talk. I probably also can thank you uh, on behalf of Mazu Islanders for your uh, amazing research. Uh, my question is really related to uh, what uh, you have been talking about earlier. I want to learn a bit more the uh, KMT and the PPT uh, re relationship, uh, Minjin and Guomindan here. So we know Mazu Islanders really um, have really a lot of uh, complicated relationship with uh, KMT. Uh, and on one hand, they really benefit from economic uh, kind of policies, and also on the other hand, the occupation and then colonization in a way. So it's very complicated. And then you mentioned about the Siminder's uh, kind of, uh, his kind of policy about Mazu. Then recently we see uh, Min Jindan really got a lot of uh, new policy going on. And especially your student, Li Wen, mm -hmm. now he's stationed there, there. So I, w I want to kind of, uh, um, would you mind like to talk a bit more about maybe the future of the Min Jindan's kind of position is go, where it's going, and then the political situation of Mazu under Min Jindan's rule. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Song Chen, thank you for raising uh, Li Wen, uh, the representative of uh, DPP in Mazu. Uh, he actually did a lot of, uh, you know, he uh, he he tried to change the image of DPP in Mazu. And I think he's been doing uh, important things. For example, you know, um, um, let me give you an example. You know, the the uh, 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 you know between the the ocean now suffers a lot of pollution, right? Uh, either the light, you know, the uh, or those uh, dredging ships, uh, you know, and um, you know the the birds which are dying, right? They are no more coming to to lay, uh, you know, eggs or something like that. So I think at least, you know, was um, uh, with after after we have Li Wen, after DPP sent a, a representative in Mazu, I think things are starting to change. You know, for example, he proposed an idea which I uh, he proposed something to DPP, which I think oh, very important because Mazu in the past, even now, practices uh, sort of uh, restricted water, which is, you know, meaning each island, you know, the China ships cannot, uh, the restricted water is only six kilometers. So it means that China ships can come so close to, to, to Mazu, whereas in, in international law or marine law, each place can have, uh, you know, they call it a territorial waters, which is 22 kilometers 
right? So, so you see, so Li Wen say, Li Wen says that, oh, if we say that, oh, we, we need to have 22 kilometers, China will protest, China will be so unhappy. So Li Wen says, that, oh, let me, let us um, expand it and then at least connect the six islands into a zone. So he called it a conservation zone to protect the birds. Right. So I think that's a very uh, interesting idea. You know, he uh, he's tried to shun off the very political issues by oh, see, we have to, you know, preserve the birds. But at the same time, expand the, the, the you know, ecological protection a little bit more. And then Li Wen, of course, he does a lot of things to bring uh, Mazu back to ROC, right? So he, Li Wen never says Taiwan. He always says ROC tries to mediate the relation between the Mazu people and 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 ROC, I think that's very important. So K TP, TPP should not forget Mazu. <laughs> right. Ah, David, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, uh, fantastic. So, um, um, so we're kind of bringing things to a um, uh, a close uh, here. We managed to fit in quite a lot of uh, a lot of questions, um, and, I, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you will now be inspired to go ahead and um, uh, read the book, and perhaps also um, try and get uh, access to the uh, uh, Le Mandi, um book as well, which I think was really kind of exciting. I don't know how how um, uh, Sol Chen, you've kind of whether that kind of brought back any memories for for you as as um, uh, as well. Um, we all. I should also note that uh, next week, which will be our last week of of term, we will have one uh, in person um, uh, event. Um, we will be inviting the um, uh, the writer uh, Melissa Fu for her uh, book launch of her her uh, new novel, uh, Peach Blossom uh, Springs. So that will be on Tuesday, uh, March twenty. Uh, second at six o'clock, and that'll be an in-person uh, event. Um, and but before um, we close, I think we should give Professor Lin a very, very big uh, round of uh, applause. Thank you. Um, please uh, email me if you have further questions. You know, I um, because of time limit, I can't really speak too much. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And, and if people would want to, um, um, if anyone wants to get into the uh, group picture, would you like to turn on your uh, your cameras? And and Holly is going to will take a um, a screenshot of um, uh, the group. Yes, yes. Aww. Oh, which is lovely. Okay, so take a picture. Three. Oh, no. If oh, you oh. give us a, a minute or or two, um, I think we've got a few more cameras coming yes. on. Oh, all right, all right. I'll take a picture now. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone yeah, thank for you, fantastic questions, you. and uh, see many of you um, in SOAS this uh, this week, and then uh, at Melissa's talk uh, next week. Mm. Thank you, Dafi, for inviting me again. Thank you for everyone coming to this uh, to 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 this talk. Hope you can make it here in, in person in the future. Sure, sure. sure. I'd love to. Thank right. you. See you everyone. Bye then. Bye bye. bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.